Uh, yeah, my name is Kyle Woodward. I am a data engineer and research scientist at Spatial Informatics Group. Um, I am presenting for this chapter today on behalf of Karis Tennyson. Uh, like Jeff has said before, we are going to go into chapter 4.4, which is change detection. So the outline for all of these video series uh, is that we go through the overview of the chapter. We go in and explain the theory behind the remote sensing analysis that we're going to do. And then we go into the practicum or rather go into the code and kind of go step by step, line by line through the code, explain what's happening and look at some outputs. There are, uh, there's a link right here to the slides. So feel free to following, follow along on that and feel free to also click the, the book link as well. Okay, so for this chapter, the goal is to introduce change detection. We have two learning outcomes. The first is we are gonna create a two image difference to help uh, identify areas of change. And from that, we are going to produce a change map and classify using uh, value thresholding of the difference image. This chapter assumes you know how to import images and image collections, filter image collections, and how to visualize uh, images and image collections, which we go through in part F1 of the book. We also assume you know how to perform some basic image analysis, like selecting bands, computing spectral indices, creating image masks, and classifying images into thematic layers, which we go into in part F2. So we're going to dive into the theory now behind uh, change detection. So change detection is the process of assessing landscape conditions and how they change over time by looking at the difference in the values contained within the imagery uh, acquired at multiple time steps within a period of interest. And so change detection is important for observing and quantifying, even qualifying changes in landscapes over time. We have a lot of examples of earth observation being used for change detection all over the world and for various industries and applications. Uh, several examples here is to monitor forests. So we could monitor forests for change, no change. We can even qualify or separate the change of forests into things like degradation versus deforestation. Uh, similarly, we can observe, detect, quantify changes in crops. Maybe we can detect the changes in phenology of a crop's growing season versus being harvested, something like that. Another good example is natural disasters. This image below in this slide is the uh, eruption of Mount St. Helens in 1980 as observed by Landsat. Um, and then we also have plenty of other land use uh, change detection applications like for instance, observing and quantifying the amount of um, built up or developed area that uh, sort of marches along through time uh, decades from, from decades ago. And we can observe that with Landsat due to the large archive that we have available for free. Um, the, the core idea behind leveraging earth observation for change detection is that most changes on the landscape will result in a difference of spectral values between an observation collected before the event and an observation collected after the event. And the main challenge then to the user or uh, you know, the, the specialist is to separate the real changes of interest that we're going after, that we're trying to classify from things such as noise in the data. So like spectral noise, um, shadows in the imagery due to uh, topography or clouds. Uh, we also have a seasonal variation or phenology challenge, basically separating natural phenology from changes that you're actually trying to detect. Um, lots and lots of other challenges. Other ones could be more uh, technical, like ensuring that the imagery that you are using are co-registered to each other properly. And a lot of those things are sorted out for you in Earth Engine, which is really nice. So we can kind of just focus on the science applications.
And so activities that result in pronounced changes in the values of the images for a sufficiently long time period are easier to detect. The change is easier to detect if the change occurs sort of abruptly and uh, it's observable for a longer period of time after the event. Uh, and so a good example of that is this uh, before and after image right here of uh, illegal gold mining activity in Peru. So, you know, the, the gold mining activity is not going to necessarily within 30 days reverse and show you the landscape as it was before in the left image. So it's, it's persisting long enough for us to identify and quantify the change over time without missing it. And so from there, uh, we can kind of talk about two different ways that the temporal aspect of the change detection could be a challenge. And so the first way is uh, how short-lived the change might be. So an example of that could be something like a flash flood, that if you're thinking about uh, something like Landsat, you have, depending on where you're at in the world, you have up to maybe a 15 to 20, 30 day, something like that revisit time. And so if you are um, looking for detecting change in like water levels of a river, maybe water spilled over the riverbank uh, on a specific day in the month, you know, if you're relying on a certain satellite constellation that doesn't have a quick enough revisit time, you're going to miss that entirely. Um, so that's one way that, uh, that the temporal aspect can pose a challenge. Another way is that you have changes that are subtle and occur so slowly on the landscape over time that it's quite difficult to essentially pick, say, a before and an after image, or say four images within the time period of 10 years, and actually accurately quantify and detect the change that you're going for. And so those, those instances are for applications of a denser time series, like um, Land Trender, CCDC, things that I, I believe will be gone over further in another chapter in F4. Um, so for right now, we are focused on this sort of before and after two date change detection workflow. And for this demonstration in the book, we're gonna use the application of detecting and quantifying burn scars in forests. I believe this one's gonna be in Oregon as we'll see. And so the, the good thing about you know, fires is that it kind of fits that first category that we were talking about with the temporal challenges. And Essentially, uh, if vegetation is burned, there will be a certain amount of time before that vegetation has time to regenerate. So that uh, most satellites, I know that Landsat and Sentinel-2 are used commonly for this, can detect where the vegetation has burned or rather that burn scar. Um, and there's, there's a good amount of wiggle room as far as the time series goes. So you can just say, if you focus in on, a, you know, a fire went through a certain area in a certain month of a certain year, you know that you can provide a pre-fire image and a post-fire image, and you should be able to find that burn scar and classify it with spectral uh, data. And so this workflow is four steps. First, we have the image selection and pre-processing steps. And so in this figure, that is essentially these, these two right here. We have the pre-fire and the post-fire image that are time-stamped. Um, the second step is the data transformation. And so for this, that is going to be computing spectral indices. For this case, it's going to be NBR, which stands for normalized burn ratio. We difference the pre and the post NBR image to essentially subtract the pre from the post. And that gives us our difference NBR image. So that is the data transformation step or steps. And the last uh, analytical step is classifying the difference images, image or images using uh, thresholding, value thresholding, or you can kick it up a notch and actually use a supervised classifier. The last step as always, and even a step that you should do at every step before moving on is evaluating your outputs to make sure that it makes sense from a, a logical 
uh, and scientific standpoint. Real quick, the access to the book as Jeff and I have already um, reviewed and we've put the book link in, in the chat here, but you can go to this link right here. It's on the book website. This essentially pulls down the GEE EDU book script repo, which has all of the code checkpoints for every single chapter and sub chapter. Uh, if the book doesn't show up after clicking the link, please just click the refresh button. And finally, before we go into the practicum, uh, finding help for functions is best done through sort of a series of things. Uh, first, the docs tab is your friend. It is the essentially authoritative source on what every single Earth Engine function does and how it should be used and what it should be applied to. You can also click the question mark in the code editor, which is at the top right of the code editor interface. You can get user guides for that uh, by clicking there. And then also you can always just use the open internet, um, Stack Exchange, Stack Overflow, anyone who writes any programming ends up there eventually. So uh, with that, we can go into the practicum. <clears throat> 